Hunt for Greatness Podcast. What is up, boys and girls? Welcome to the Hunt for Greatness Podcast. I got Eric Williams on, and we are talking about how to manage your time and money when it comes to fishing and having a boat. What's up, Eric Williams? Hey, man. Feels like I've been here before. Yeah, we just did a podcast before this, so it's like, uh, this is how the professionals do it. Just knock out four or five at one time. We might as well just live our life like professionals, you know? I mean, we're pretty much the best there is at everything, so (laughs) everybody should listen to everything we say on this podcast. But you guys, welcome. If you guys never seen this podcast before... There's all kinds of different podcasts that I do. I got comedians on. I got fishermen on. I got all kinds. I got preachers on here. We're talking about aliens and stuff. So you never know. Let me straighten this camera. You never know what we're going to be talking about. I think it's a little... There we go. There we go. We straight now, boy. But yeah, we're going to talk about uh, saving money and time on the water. And I think a lot of people can benefit from this. uh, Because a lot of people are like us. And they kind of had to live their life on a budget. That was what I heard a lot growing up. My mom would always say, hey, we're on a budget. We were never not on a budget growing up. And my parents were, you know, well off. We, you know, didn't have to worry about having food on the table, which I think is well off. We always had a house. We never had to move around, do any kind of crazy stuff. So I think that's well off. I mean, I don't know how much money they had, but we were always on a budget. So I've kind of, it, it instilled in me that uh, not to be wasteful of food and not to be wasteful of money, not to buy things I don't need, you know, so it kind of goes hand in hand. And I think you're the same way from what I, you're pretty, pretty frugal, you know, you don't buy a bunch of stuff you don't need. Yeah, I heard no growing up. Um, And the common one my dad would say is, oh, you want that? All right, well, shit in one hand and want in the other, see which one fills up first. (laughs) I ain't never heard that. that. That was what I heard a lot. So, See which uh, one feels up first. <laughs> that's awesome. So, uh, yeah, that's that's my experience with it. So everything I have is because I did it, which is, there's some pride in that. But uh, at the same time, I have to be smart about how I spend my time and money. Yeah, because time is money. It is when you are your own business owner. Any time you're spending doing something else is, is time you're not making money. Yeah, so yeah, that's we're definitely going to talk about that. Um and we're we're kind of in a similar situation where we can kind of take days off that we want for the most part. And I know a lot of people probably are not in that situation, and that's okay too. You know, this will still help you. There's still things we're going to talk about that will help. But uh when you're when you're operating a boat, especially like the new boat that you just got, when you're operating a bigger boat, like you tend to have to spend more money on stuff and it gets very expensive if you're not doing things yourself but anyway let's talk about some of the things we have on here we'll kind of stay on uh on task here but the first thing we have on our list excuse me is tackle and it's um buying the right thing in the first place is what you brought up so explain what you mean by that it's really easy to get caught in the marketing of that looks good. I'm going to buy one of those, but that doesn't mean that you can catch fish with it. So, um, one of the things that we talked about when making our list was having somebody to almost mentor you or someone that you can talk to that says, okay, I'm, I'm catching fish on this. You don't need 75 different Z-Man colors. You can get by with white chartreuse, gold flake, and red bone. Four packs of Z-Man versus you going in there and spending $50 on soft plastics. So having somebody to talk to, maybe a tackle shop that you trust, for example, like I can go talk to Tex at Texas Tackle for an hour, and I know that whatever he tells me is genuine information. And that, that that's very important in not spending money on things that you don't need. I've got $200 worth of Z-Man sitting in my closet. So do I, Unfo- so do I man. Unfortunately, <laughs> I, I'm that guy where it's like, if it looks good to me, I barely ever even use soft plastics. Yeah. Unfortunately, like that's not really how I fish most of the time. So, you know, it's I've spent so much money on. I mean, dude, there's stuff just laying around in this garage that I may never use. And you know how to catch fish. And I know how to catch fish. It's just hard when I go in intercoastal anglers, dude. It's hard to spend less than like two hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. Like every time I go in, you know. So, getting getting the right tackle the first time is, uh, yeah, you know, having a network that you can bounce stuff off of is very important when it Mm -hmm. comes to saving money and time 
because, you know, if we're going to go out fishing, you know, uh, two days from now or tomorrow, if we're going to go out tomorrow, I call you or whoever's been out there like, hey, you know, where are you guys having the best luck at? Um, where do you think is going to be good tomorrow? Um, having that's going to save a lot of time and gas money to have those people that you can like people you trust, like you're talking about. So Mm -hmm. network, networking and having a good network. It takes time and effort to have a good network. Like you can't just expect me to tell you spots and things of that nature. If you're not giving as well, it's it's like any relationship. You can't just take, 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 take because no relationship works like that. And if they do, they're unhealthy. And most people are smart enough not to be in unhealthy relationships. Like I have people who hit me up on social media and they're like, hey, where were you at? And I'm like, I'm not telling you where I was at. How many spots you told me, bro? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like <clears throat> you can't just take and expect things to be given to you in return. You know, is that your kind of your experience too? Yeah, like, for with sure. With your good people in your network? For sure. I mean, my, I live life by a small circle. You know, like, it's, it's not that I don't like people per se. It's just that, I don't know, the older you get, the more you realize there, there, there's a lot of people that just want to take from you and they don't offer you a lot of value. And not that you should look at somebody as an investment, but at the same time, like, you get what you give or it should be that way. So having good people around you is, is extremely important in fishing. I think Lil Wayne said it best. He says, ain't no eating at the table if you're bringing nothing to it. Yeah, that's true. That's really true. And we get straight to it like there's nothing to it. All right? (laughs) So get you a good network. It's the same thing as a relationship. Yeah. Like me and you have a relationship, and neither one of us just take from one another. We both give everything we can give, every bit of knowledge we have. And there is only a handful of people that I have that I do that with, you know, which is totally fine. I don't need 100 people. Mm -hmm. I need like three or four. Yeah. And that's kind of... It's kind of what I need. So network is important. Yeah. And um, uh, we started off talking about tackle. Tackle, yes. Um, I wanted to add something to that. So if you're new to fishing or or you're trying to figure out the best way to catch fish, is just go live bait. Because you can pay $5 for a nice rig, catch your mullet. Well, you need a net for that. But uh, just go live bait. You can buy your bait. But most of the time, in my experience... Anything caught on artificial is a lot harder to be successful than if I were to just drop live bait. Hundred percent. So, and and if you plan on doing this long term, go ahead and buy all the stuff to make your own rigs, because you potentially you've got a dollar or two dollars in material, but you're going to pay five six dollars at the tackle store. If you just make buy, your own yeah. rigs, that's how you say money. Yeah, buy, even get get one that's pre made as an example. Yeah, and then just copy it. Buy yeah. your five dollar rig one time and just yeah. keep it. And yeah. copy. That's what I did for grouper rigs. Mm-hmm. Like I asked people, but I also bought a pre-made grouper rig. I'm like, all right, so it's three foot, and then it's four foot, or it's crimped here and it's snail knotted here. You know, mm-hmm. I just had the example. I had to sit around and mess up like three or four of them to figure it out. But now I, I got it. Yeah, some people may be <clears> like, well, you're gonna spend fifteen, twenty dollars on crimps and five dollars on the actual or crimping tools, and then five dollars on crimps, and then twenty dollars on mono. Yeah, you could have bought six or seven rigs at that price but at the same time once you buy that once you've got it for life yeah and once you have that knowledge it's there Mm -hmm. there's nothing that can replace uh nothing can really replace experience and experience sometimes expensive Mm -hmm. unfortunately and it's a lot of time it's time consuming and that goes back to the mentor thing you have somebody that's really good at fishing that's willing to help you out listen because they're gonna they're gonna save you in ways that you don't even understand because you haven't been there to fail right and we talked about this before, not acting like you know everything, people will tell you a lot more. So I've always heard this growing up, the smartest man knows the least. So if I'm not a know-it-all or acting like a know-it-all, you know, people tend to give you more information, you know, if they think that you don't know as much. And, and most of the time, you really don't know as much as you think you know. Yeah. Yeah, here's an example. Um, I went into Intracoastal two days ago, and uh, I was looking at rods, and I had a rod picked out that I liked because I wanted to get something for grouper, and it was rated up to 80-pound 80, 80 line. I said, that should, should be good enough, and, you know, I, I know quite a bit about fishing, but I don't know a lot about grouper fishing. I'm still learning. So I asked the guy there, I'm like, hey, man, uh, you know, 
what, what kind of rod do you think I should get for grouper fishing? I got this reel. I want to put it on. I was like, do you do a lot of grouper fishing? And he was like, yeah, I do. We sat there and talked for 15, 20 minutes. He got me everything I need for rigs, which I didn't realize you need a lot more weight because you're trying to stay vertical with your line. Not something I knew. If I didn't talk to him that way, I wouldn't have known that. And also he's like, yeah, that 80 pound rod that you're looking at, that'll work. But if you hook a big fish, you're not pulling them out of the rocks with that. So I could have potentially spent $250 on that rod if I didn't humble myself and say, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you help me find the right rod? So saving that money on the rod and then I'm going to have something that may actually land me a big fish this fall. That's just one example of asking for help. And that even goes back to relationships. You just build a relationship with that guy. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to be around and know it all. Nobody. Yeah. So the more, you know, you're humble, the more friends you will make, the more good relationships you you will make, you know, it's like you... You made a relationship with that guy in the tackle shop. He's going to remember you when you came in. He's like, oh, this guy wasn't a dick. He wasn't a know-it-all. I'd like to help him again. Yeah. I mean, and he probably will help you again. Yeah, if you're if you're not the expert, and even if you are, don't act like it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So that, that's definitely some good information for tackle and building relationships. So when you're buying something for a boat, how do you decide whether to buy something nicer that's going to last you or something cheaper because it's probably going to be a throwaway anyway. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's really easy to go to Walmart and buy a $50 rod and reel combo that you think is going to work for, oh, I'm only fishing two days a year. Okay, that's fine. Well, you use it once in the salt water. It, it gets a little bit of sand behind the, the gears and everything and it gets a little bit wet. Well, next time you get to use it, it ain't going to work anymore. Whereas if you had to spend a hundred bucks on a combo, that may last you years because they're designed for that saltwater use. I'm always on the line of like, I'm going to spend a little bit more for the quality. And, uh, you know, you really do get what you pay for in fishing. And, and how important is it to take care of that stuff? Yeah, I wash down everything after I use it uh, with fresh water. And that goes for my boat motor, uh, trailer, trailer hubs, axles. Um, anything that the salt water touches, I'm spraying down with fresh water and that's after every use. Salt water destroys everything. It does. So if you don't take care of your, that's how you save a lot of money. Taking care of your equipment, your boat, your trailer, putting the earmuffs on there, running the fresh water through it. Um, I know it takes longer, but in the end it's going to, I mean, yes, you have to do it. There's a trade off here. You do have to trade a little bit of time to save some money sometimes, you know, and it's like. It's definitely important to take care of your gear. If you don't have money to just throw away two, three hundred dollar reels all the time, maintaining, learning how to maintain things yourself. How important do you think that is? Yeah, that that goes back to let's just talk about a trailer for example. I've got leaf springs. If I every time I fished, I did not spray off my leaf springs, I'd be replacing those springs every year, maybe every nine months. But I wash them down, and they usually last me a couple of years. That's just one scenario. So like with your boat motor. You got you know do do all your oil changes your your gear oil down in the lower unit um, your filters ch- change fuel water separator do it all every hundred hours and your motor is going to last a lot longer than than what it would be for somebody that just sticks it at the sloop uh, sloop ramp and leaves it you know like you got to keep your stuff up yeah and it's not hard to do a service it's really not it's a lot of screw on screw off Allen keys. Um, Drink, like you buy a pump for your lower unit one time. It's a little $10 pump. And it's it ends up being at least half of the price of taking it to get it serviced. And you don't have to have your boat in the shop for a week. Yeah. And most places, like Marine Warehouse, for example, that's where I go. Marine Warehouse will literally tell you every single thing that you need to service your boat. They'll go, they'll pick it out for you. And if you ask them, like, hey, how do I do that? I, I ain't afraid to ask a question. How do I do this? They're like, oh, you just screw it on, screw it off. I'm like, okay, sweet. How do I check if this is good? Oh, you just pour your fuel water separator. You just pour that into a cup, see if there's a bunch of gas and water in it, and that's how you know if if it's working. You mm-hmm. know, so don't be afraid to ask questions. It goes back to being humble. But like, if if you go to any boat maintenance place, marine warehouses, my where where do you like to go to get your stuff? 
Uh, I used to use Marine Warehouse for everything, but then I found uh, online a, a Yamaha dealer that will actually bundle the whole service kit for like 80 bucks. That's what Adam was telling me. Yeah. So, so you save money like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's really? way cheaper. You really? buy the, It's a box that everything comes in. Wow. See, I didn't know that. See, and I, I need to figure out if there's one for Suzuki because now I have a Suzuki and a Yamaha. So they're going to be different. So yeah. I, I have some learning to do too. Yeah, I need the one for Suzuki too because that's what I have. Yeah. So you can save money like that. Yeah, it's, I think it's called Parts View. So maybe if you don't know, I actually have a video on this channel that tells you how to service uh, my 70 horsepower Suzuki. Um, I think it's how to service your own. I'll link it in the description here. But uh, there's videos on YouTube that show you everything, how to do everything pretty much. Yeah, and uh, I know that if... The impeller is a scary one for people because they, the word impeller sounds terrifying, but that's not even hard to change yourself. It's a $30 piece of plastic, comes in a kit with all your seals and everything, and your lower unit is a sealed uh, piece that actually attaches up into like the motor. Like five bolts? Yeah. This, yeah. yeah. It's just unscrew some bolts, the lower unit drops, and your, your impeller's right there. You kind of only have to do that every couple years, too? Yeah, every, like, 300 hours. Yeah, is so probably every two years for us, or yeah. a year and a half, yeah. usually for... Yeah, actually, like it might that. be 400, but I'm crazy, and I do it every three. I think it is. I think it's recommended at three. Okay. I think, I think you're right. Um, or, or every two years. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it's four or five bolts. If you may, If you take pictures... Whenever you're taking something apart, use your cell phone, take pictures of what it looks like before you take it apart. That way you have something to reference. Yeah. I mean, that's what I do all the time because I'm a moron and I forget how stuff is put together. And I have all these parts in the driveway and don't know what I'm doing. And that's frustrating. You can't put your stuff back together. Mm -hmm. um, servicing your own boats, rods, yeah. or reels. Everything. Yeah, service everything yourself. That's You save a lot of money like that. Gas. Um, we put... 87 in our boats because and it has ethanol in it because we run our boats all the time but a lot of guys if you're not going to run your boat all the time 93 non-ethanol is important but if you're running your boat all the time the way i understand it and i've never had any issues is you can put 87 or 89 in your boat and you'll be fine we do it in the bull's bay my boat sips gas my skiff so i put 93 non-ethanol in it just to be on the safe side mm -hmm. but what what do you think about that like what kind of gas to run in a boat if you talk to any mechanic, they're going to say, it's not the gas that's the issue, it's that the gas eats the rubber hoses, and then you have issues. So the ethanol is, is the problem, and, and if it sits, it's going to start eating away your, your rubber. Okay. So I personally always use 93, Okay. and I have a fuel water separator, and I have a filter on the motor. So my, my stuff's getting filtered multiple times. And uh, I also... I've used my boat a lot, so I'm always burning gas. But if you're if you're going to leave your boat and you're concerned about the gas going bad, use some stabilizer. So say say you're winterizing. I never winterize anything because I fish all year long. Yeah, yeah. But just put uh, stable stabilizer in your uh, in your gas, and it'll it'll keep everything fine for months at a time. Nice. If you got a boat in a wet slip, I didn't know this till this year. If you got a boat in a wet slip, um, Eric actually knew about this, but if you keep a boat in a wet slip, the marina gas is always like a dollar more at least than what your gas on the hill, they call it on the hill, but like your regular gas at a gas pump is always cheaper than marina gas. So, because marina gas is convenient, you can pull right up to the slip. We got a gas tank, it's a 190 gallon we got from Tractor Supply. It was like 1300 bucks for the, the uh, pump and everything. So, if you keep your boat in a wet slip and you want to pump your own gas, a lot of charter guys will put gas into their tank of their truck and it'll save you hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I know that doesn't apply to a lot of people probably watching this, but it's a way to save money on gas if your boat is in a wet slip. And I just want to put that out there because I didn't know that. Well, and they make the smaller ones that are uh, plastic too. Like I my, didn't know that. Yeah, my, so my boss, uh, he had a little plastic wood wheels and it would hold like 20 gallons. Okay. So he, he would roll it down the dock and he would... It gases boat up so there, that is a cheaper alternative for somebody yeah. that has a small tank or and that's in a wet slip that's right they yeah. don't want to pull their boat out yeah. every time that mm -hmm. they have to fill up so just something to think about as far as gas um fixing things instead of buying new things the first thing that comes to my mind is a cast net they're so expensive and i rip holes in mine all the time 
So mending a cast net, um, instead of if a rod blows apart and there's a way to fix it, fix it instead of buying a new one, maybe, sometimes. So you have to make a judgment call. What do you think of whenever it comes to like fixing something instead of buying a brand new one just without looking at it? K Pasa Amigos, quick message. If you guys drop a comment in the comment section, I'll choose somebody randomly to get one of these shirts. Love you guys. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Yeah, a lot of times you I break rod tips. So go ahead and get on Amazon and buy you a $12 kit that has every size in it. And then you can change your own rod tips for the cost of, you know, whatever divide that out is, however much a, a specific piece is, and just a little bit of super glue. Mm. But if you take it to a tackle shop, you're going to spend $15, $20 on an eye. That's true. So, And another thing is like, if you fish often, you're going to break off often, and eventually you're going to start wearing through your line. So just even though like you feel like you need that really expensive braid, which you, which you do, I'm going to argue that you do need braid, instead of just re-spooling every time, you can always backfill with mono. Yeah. Interesting. And then once you burn through the rest of that braid, rip all that mono off and start fresh with new braid. And that'll save a good amount of money because that braid's expensive. Over time, it will save you money. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's definitely uh, that's definitely helpful. Um, all right. So product research. It's a big one on how to save money, and you're really good at research and stuff. Um, Product research. You said something earlier about the whole truth. Tell me what that is. Uh, so the whole truth is a discussion board online for fishermen across America. If there is something you have questions about, there's going to be probably at least four or five different discussion boards that detail people's opinions on what you should do in this situation. And there's they're going to date all the way back to the early 2000s, and you'll see stuff that's a year old. So what I do is like... If, Say, for example, I just bought a 2013. I'm looking at stuff from like 2013 to now. I'm getting people's opinions. I'm, I'm seeing what is the best way to handle this situation. And uh, you can get a lot of good information and steer you in the right direction from there. Another way, if you want like an entry-level way to like understand a, a situation or how to fix something is YouTube. It's huge. There is a video on everything out there, and if there's not one, you should consider making one for it because information is at our fingertips today with technology if it's discussion boards if it's youtube um you can get help and it's a lot cheaper and it'll save you a lot of time and money if you start figuring out how to research the right direction to go in the first place yeah yeah for sure and and it, time and money kind of go hand in hand so we want to speak about both of these things um time like let's talk about some time all right so um time management how do you know you've overstayed your welcome in a spot normally. Because in order to save time, we don't spend too much time in one spot. So how do you know when to change spots? A lot of times, if I'm going to catch a fish, it's going to be really quickly or shortly after I stop there. Same. Always. And a lot of times, like conditions may kind of keep you fishing an area longer than you like because it's just not favorable anywhere else. But... The best thing I can say you should do is, is give yourself a timer, time limit. Like, okay, I'm going to spend 10, 15 minutes here. If I don't get a bite, I'm moving on. And go ahead and plan ahead of time of different areas that you want to hit while you're out fishing and kind of bounce to each. And eventually, you're that's that's grinding. That's fishing a lot of days. You grind long enough, something's going to work out for you. Right. So one other thing we talked about as far as time management. Okay, you've overstayed your welcome at a spot not making too long of a run because it seems like most of the time if I make a 30 minute run and especially if it's 30 minutes further from where I have to go to take the boat out that's another hour of my time that I'm potentially wasting yeah you know so like trying to find another spot near it's hard when you're in a boat with a big motor on it you know you're not in a kayak or a slow boat like you're like oh I can make this run it's cool but like if you burn up all that time, you could be fishing at a spot that's two miles away instead of 20 miles away. Like You're really taking a risk as far as as much time. Time is our worst enemy out there because it's not, especially on a charter, Like time is my worst enemy. I have to make something happen in the shortest amount of time possible. So like, how do you decide? Do you normally 
your personal experience, do you normally try to stay in a certain area or do you make long runs? Like how do you, know, if you're not catching fish, you're having to bounce around? A lot of times I know that I'm going to have the most success early and late. So I will go to in my, the day. yeah, okay. I will go to my further places first and okay. work my way back so that I'm not wasting time driving. I'm driving when I would likely be catching le- less fish to begin with. And I'm actually able to spend time fishing right around dark when it's usually on instead of driving all the way back to the ramp because I'm really far away. So it's you, all methodical. Yeah. So do you try to, if you're fishing in a tide dependent area, are you trying to, if you're going to make a long run, base that on the tide? Like when you think it's going to be the, the least amount of fish biting, like that's when you need to move if you need to Really run. good fishermen f- ride the tide. Yeah. I don't ride the tide like I should. And I, I know that. Really good fishermen know, okay, an hour away from here is high tide. That means that 30 minutes from now, it's going to be high tide halfway back home and then an hour from now it'll be high tide at the ramp it's really good fishermen learn how to ride the tide yeah my best inshore days have been riding the tide Mm -hmm. my best days like figuring out looking at your tide tables calculating okay so i need to run here for i need to run south for 30 minutes as soon as i put the boat in but i can ride the tide the whole way back to where i put the boat in and it maximizes my fishing time that way yeah but you're right. Like really, really, really good fishermen uh, have good time management, mm-hmm. and they have the knowledge, you know. And it takes experience, it takes failure sometimes to figure that out. But um, I'm yeah. hard headed, man. I know that, and everybody at home, y'all hard headed too. Don't even try to front. <laughs> but I'll be, I'll be like, all right, I'm fishing here today, and I, if I, if I stick to my guns, I'll have a lot less probability of catching fish than if I were to deviate based on the conditions that I'm seeing. Yeah, that's exactly what I was about to bring up. So adapting the circumstance, like yeah. not necessarily sticking to your plan in your head that you made the night before, because rarely does that ever work out in my yeah. experience. Yeah, it's different for us because we we film what we fish. So for example, if I, the past two trips I've been on, I've, I've been like, I want to catch drum on the jetty. I've made my mind up and dropping live bait because it's almost that time of year. Well, I've seen fish busting, you know, a mile out, birds going crazy. I should go catch those fish, but I'm hard-headed, and I'm like, no, I'm fishing the jetty. I have to make myself. So if I were to just deviate, I'd have a great day, go catch some fish. I can always come back after I get tired of catching them. But if I were to just pay attention to the conditions, okay, look, there's bait out there. Let me go fish this bait. You know, there might be reds underneath the bait. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know until you go try it. It's it a lot of what we do is, is deviate and and try to focus on what's in front of us. Yeah. How important do you think it is? This kinda goes into time management as well. When you go out, not to just hit the spots that you thought about the night before, but to maybe at least put one new spot in there. Like try something new and maybe not dedicate a ton of time to it, but just see how see what happens. Yeah. You think that's important? I I do, um but it's really important to look at the pressure that the area has too. So for example, if there's 10 boats on the jetty, you, you, have, you have a one in 10 chance of catching that one redfish that's swimming through, mm-hmm. you know, if everybody's using live bait. Whereas if you get, if you hit a spot that's new, that's kind of off to itself, I, I do think that's really smart to do that. Yeah. That's normally how my new spots normally are not publicly like well known for me. Yeah. Like it's usually something that's kind of, I'm like, I probably won't catch fish here, but this could be a honey hole. Yeah. You know? I think that's that's good with time management. We, we put something else on here. Um, going with your gut. How important do you think that is as far as time management? You said you're hard-headed. So, well, like, your brain and your gut could be telling you two different things, right? Uh, yeah, that, yeah. I, I'm conflicted a lot. But at the same time, my fishing depends on how successful I've been lately. So, if I've had... For example, I've had two skunk days where I just caught some little black sea bass. My next day I go fishing, I got to catch fish. I can't afford to go three days and not catch fish. So I'm going to be a lot more open to adapting to what's in front of me, less focused on I want to catch a red on the jetty. Right. But if I'm going like on Sunday and I just want to, I want to catch a fish, I got my, my kids with me, they want to catch fish, yeah, you have to follow your gut. And if you see something that's happening and, and you, something's telling you to go try it, you should. 
because you're gonna learn something too. I I rarely regret that. Like if 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 my gut's telling me something, and I follow that instinct. Usually, if you're out there enough, your instincts probably are correct for the most part. And that goes back to adapting the circumstance. But like going with my gut, I rarely regret that. And you know, my brain could be telling me something else. Stick it out. Stick it out. Stick it out. You know. But in my my gut, it's like you need to go catch those fish that are busting just go catch a couple of them like it doesn't matter really to us what we catch for the most part we just like to catch fish you know we enjoy catching fish so going with your gut is definitely uh how how important do you think it is of like having a backup plan when you go out because i know we said you can't really ever stick to plans but like like okay say for example you want to go out you want to live bait fish the jetty right you're spending you're spending a bunch of time catching mullet you spent an hour trying to get mullet right how important would it be hey i've got a bag of frozen mullet maybe we'll just try some cut bait and i'll get to fish for 30 extra minutes like it's kind of a it's kind of a trade-off too because if the fish are eating live bait and you don't have enough you're not going to catch as many fish but if the fish are eating whatever you might catch double the fish because you're sitting in the spot for an hour longer than you would have been yeah I've always thought that if I can get live bait or fresh bait, that's going to be the winner, whether it be dead the or alive. The difference between catching fresh, or not. Yeah, fresh is really important. Um, if, if you, say you get off work at 5 and you can be at the ramp at 5.30 and you've got two hours to fish, well, you may not have time to, to catch live bait. And if you don't, hey, you should still go fishing. Have a backup plan. Yeah. So have something in the boat where it's like, I said not really what I wanted to yeah. use, but at least I'll get to fish for an hour and a half mm-hmm. instead of 30 minutes. Yeah, one of the working at uh, seafood market for years. One of our best best baits was the salted mullet. Mm. You know, like when fresh mullet weren't available, the surf fishermen would come in and buy salted mullet. That stuff had been sitting in a salt brine for months, and uh, not fresh at all. But it's better than nothing. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Saving time and money. Did we get? Do you think we covered? Does anything stand out to you that we missed as far as saving time and money? Uh, yes, we, often we, we only get to fish when we're off work. And if you have flexibility in your calendar, pay attention to the the days that look like it would be a good day to fish. Because a lot of times the overall success and quality of a day that I get to fish is based on the conditions. And it, I get it if you're a Friday or if you're a Saturday, Sunday guy. That's Weekend about, war. Yeah, that's yeah. all you can do. I get it. Go fishing. But if you have flexibility and you can take that Tuesday off because Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is, is glass, then try to move your schedule around and focus on the weather days. Pick your days. That optimizes your time. Mm-hmm. And money because if yep. you go out and you're running too far or this and that, like it's a waste of money and time. Yeah, and you're... And, if the weather's not cooperating, your your overall experience isn't going to be that fun compared to what it would be like if you had picked the right day. For sure. You can be miserable out there. I mean, I, my last two days, man, I've, I've been going when it blowing 15, 20 because I got a bigger boat. I'm like, I can fish now. Yeah. I'm getting skunked. Yeah. Because it ain't the right weather. You know, like I got to, I got to, I have lessons I learned too. You know, just, just because you and I fish a lot doesn't mean that we aren't humbled out there every time we go. For sure. And if you're picking a day to fish you're not working so yeah we don't get paid really to fish for the most i mean unless i'm running a charter or something but like i'm not just spending money on gas and bait and everything else but i'm also missing the money that i could have made that day by grinding working advertising calling people knocking doors whatever you got to do to get the money Mm -hmm. so i'm not only just losing a hundred dollars in gas and tackle but i'm losing three, four, five, maybe $500 that I could have made it work. So picking your days is, that's how you save money. Mm-hmm. It's a big deal. Yeah. He, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say it really matters. It does. It really matters. You guys go over to Eric's page, check his page out. A lot of cool fishing videos. Um, and uh, we both kind of do the same thing. This is, uh, this is cool because we get to kind of talk about fishing. You guys get to learn a little bit about us. Eric is a realtor at Ness Realty. If you need to sell your house, you need to buy a house, hit Eric up. Um, I think we covered everything. Pretty if you guys uh, have some shingles missing on your roof, call <laughs> Lex, okay? He, he, he uh, sells roofs. He, he takes these roofs that have a little bit of issues, and he gets you a new one put on. He never talks about it, 
but he should, and I'm yeah. gonna start helping him push that. Yeah, we'll get you a new roof for the price of your deductible. So you guys, if if you have an older roof and there's anything that looks weird to you on that roof, even if there's not, sometimes you can't see it from the ground. But I'll get up there. I ain't scared. I'll get on a steep roof. I got all the equipment, all the safety equipment. You guys call me if y'all think you might need a new roof. I'll get you a new roof. Especially after this hurricane. Yeah, yeah, there's a hurricane out there. You guys need new roofs. Hit me up. 919-888-1682. That's my number. Y'all hit me up. Uh, if you want to book a charter trip, um, go on our website, huntrigscharterco.com. It's real easy to book a trip. You can do it all online. Uh, you can pay your deposit on there. Super easy. Um, all the descriptions there. If you guys have any questions about any of that stuff on the website, just hit me up on Instagram, message me on Facebook, or just give me a call. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thanks for watching the channel. Don't forget to hit subscribe. Go over to Eric's channel, hit subscribe. And we love you guys. Eric, thanks for doing the podcast. Thanks, man. It was a blast. Hunt for Greatness Podcast.